Hi, I'm Caroline from Doodles and Digits. Are you ever curious about how math is actually used in the real world? Today, we get to go behind the scenes of three different businesses. We first get to take a look at how bakers use math every single day at a bakery. Then, we get to take a look behind the scenes of how an architect uses math to build houses. And finally, we get to take a sneak peek at a dentist's office to see how he uses math every single day. Let's get into it. Doodly doodle, doodly doodle, doodly doodles and digits. Area symmetry fractions too. It's all here for you. My name is Wendy Miller Pugh. I am a co owner of Bake Me Happy, a 100% gluten free bakery. We started in 2013. I believe we moved down here in Marion Village in 2014. So do the math on that on here. In the bakery, we use tons of math from using measuring cups, doing fractions, percentages, scaling up things, or sometimes if we missed an ingredient, a lot of times we have to do a percentage to try to get back to where we we're supposed to be. Multiplication with counting our cookies, like our trays are always Usually the same configuration of cookies, so um, you know we could do like a four by six, that's 24. We have 10 trays, that's 240. So we do that quite a bit. There, there is literally math everywhere. A lot of people might think that you just start from total scratch with the recipe. What I do is I start with a base recipe. So say we wanted to make a new muffin. We have a muffin recipe that is pretty solid that we can change it to what we need. So we would change the ingredient by trial and error. That's a big thing. If we want it to be a more dense muffin, we would add more flour to it, maybe more fat like sour cream. If we want it to be lighter for us, gluten-free. We have different flour alternatives. We have different mixes that create different textures. So a lighter mix might be lighter grains like rice and tapioca flour, like starchy things. Something denser might have more like sorghum flour or brown rice flour. I remember when I first started, we have a spicy peanut butter cookie and that went through a million different iterations to get the right level of spice. So it wasn't like obliterating your taste buds. Question with the baker. Why do you love math? Um, I did love doing math when I was growing up. My favorite thing was figuring it out. Like I am a lover of puzzles and different tricky word things or math games. And I just felt like I always liked to do math. There was always a correct answer. It was never open to interpretation. And there were always different ways to get the correct answer. Those are the things I really loved about math growing up. How do you use fractions? I know that a lot of people are scared of fractions. They're hard. The systems with getting the denominators the same, very frustrating. We use them a lot, measuring our ingredients, obviously in the cup, scaling up. A lot of times it'll be like, let's use a quarter cup more or half a teaspoon more. But yeah, all the cups are in increments of a third, a fourth, a half. Knowing that if I need seven eighths of something, I can take out, you know, what is an eighth a cup? I don't have an eighth a cup measure, but I know an eighth a cup is a half of a fourth of a cup. So just knowing those basic things so you can get the guesstimations. How important is it to be precise? Mm, baking is really a science. Um, cooking is more of a creativity based activity. Baking, you need to have the right amount of materials and right amount of proportions of your different ingredients, especially a leavener, which is like your baking soda or baking powder. You do need the right proportions in your recipe or it won't come out right. What measuring tools do you use? We use a lot of rulers with cutting things to make them precise. We use the cup measures, the teaspoon measures. We use scales, squid measuring cups, which are ones that have the handle, which is exactly, you know, a fourth a cup in a cup is gonna measure a fourth a cup in the liquid, but 
just easier. We have timers. We have a base time that we have for all of our items. How do you figure out the price? This is the hardest, and I think this is where a lot of businesses might fail. And this is where I do a lot of math, and I kind of like it, but it's hard to get everything in the right measurements, I think. So my spreadsheet, it will have, I'll have a recipe I'm using in mind, and it will say butter. A case of butter is how much? A case of butter is $100. So you put those two measurements in, and then how much do you use in the recipe? And then it calculates how much money you use in the recipe. And it creates the price for that. So, and we have to keep an account of the labor of someone making it. So the labor means, say I'm the person making it, how much I get paid an hour, or how much my time is worth and then how long it takes me to do it. And then also if we package it, the packaging price, how long it takes you to package it, any labels you might put on it. Say a roll of labels costs $200, there's a thousand labels on the roll, how much is one label? It'll give you a price of how much money you put into it. Most people will do a markup of like 30 to 50%, depends on the product. And then you kind of compare that to your other products, like does this, price of $3 fit with my other products or is it really low or is it really high and sometimes you have to adjust it so it kind of fits within your whole array of your products you have. It's a lot of math especially figuring out like say a 25 pound bag of flour how much that costs and then how much does a fourth of a cup weigh and then how many fourth of a cups are in this 25 pound bag? How much was my bag? And so it's a lot to figure out. And I think a lot of people starting businesses, they fail to do all that hard work because it's hard. <laughs> it's hard, it's time consuming. What is your best piece of advice for math students? I think right now math, as we've seen how I did it when I was younger, and now seeing where my daughter is, there are more than one way to get to an answer. You might ask your mom or dad to help and they're not doing it like your teacher does, but there are many paths in math. If you're doing it correctly, you'll get to the same answer. So I think that's the one thing that's kind of amazing about math. We all think differently and our brains learn differently. That math was everywhere. You think that you're working on these problems at school and you'll never use them again, and really, you will use them. Whether you are a baker, or whether you are something that's math heavy, like an accountant, or whether you are something you think you're never gonna use math again, like, I don't know, a cosmetologist who colors hair, she still has to weigh out the hair dye. <laughs> so it really is everywhere, and calculators are okay to use, believe me. I even have to calculate eight times six sometimes because my brain just isn't working and I'm not very good at multiplying my eights for some reason. Challenge problem, bakery edition. Wendy needs to bake 500 spicy peanut butter cookies for tomorrow. One tray holds 25 cookies. How many trays will Wendy need to make? Go ahead and pause this video to take your time and solve. Did you get it correct? Did you use a different strategy? Wow, that just made me really hungry. So now that we know how bakery uses math, how do you think an architect uses math? My name is Jamie Parrish and I'm an architect who specializes in residential architecture. I have been an architect for about 10 or 11 years and practicing architecture uh, for probably about 20, I would say. Okay, so what is an architect? An architect is a person who designs buildings and advises in their construction. Starts with uh, potential clients calling me um, to see if I am available to do the kind of project that they want to do. 
and I do custom homes from scratch. I do addition and remodeling projects to like, existing buildings. I work on older houses and newer houses, and I kind of like the range that I'm able to do. Once a client hires me, yeah. I will start in the design phase, and that's where I'm doing everything by hand, sketching out ideas of, you know, we could do the family room here, or we could do it here, and it connects to the kitchen in this way. So we look at lots of different options in the design phase of what, what the possibilities are. And of course, what does that look like on the outside? Once the clients review that and comment on what their likes and dislikes are, then I'll eventually get into um, more detailed drawings where I go in the computer and I dimension walls and cabinets and everything else that might need to might be done any structural work I need to think through how am I how am I going to add um, anything to a building and make sure that the weight that's coming from above is still being dispersed the way that it needs to be and that gives us more of an idea of the scope of work of any project and then at that point, I oftentimes bid the project. So that means that um, I will take the design and drawings that we have, and we'll usually ask a few different contractors to give us prices for my clients. And that part of my process also includes math also because I need to look at all the numbers that they have for all the different parts of a building, foundation, framing, countertops, cabinets, all of that, and, and compare to see who's giving us the best value. And then once construction begins, um, I oftentimes will go out to the site to make sure that my drawings were understood properly. So my drawings are in 2D. I do a lot of 3D sketches, but my drawings are very much in, in 2D. And so it's my job to communicate how I want the 3D structure to look. So now that we know what an architect is, can we have an example of a time that you designed a house using math? Before we started this house, this was, or this remodel, um, it was a very small kitchen. It was probably, this was probably the edge of it. So this was the wall and this was the kitchen. And uh, just your typical 1920s old home kitchen. Um, the opening that, that you can't see right now, just a door into the dining room. So what we needed to do is we wanted to keep the character and the scale of our existing little house, but open it up and modernize it for um, for the way that we live now. So I drew all of this out in the computer. I know to the quarter inch how much space we have and how I might be able to maneuver things around so that things feel right and look right. I also do 3D sketches too, so not just to show me, but like to show my clients this is what the space is going to look like. This is where the couch is going to be. This is how it's going to feel when it's done. I measure furniture when I'm designing. I make sure that every single room, we know exactly how many people we want to sit in that room, what furniture is going to fit, how big or how deep are cabinets, how deep is this island, how wide can the island be before it starts to look too long and skinny. How much walkway space is comfortable? When you take the dishwasher down, can we still maneuver around it? There's so many things that kind of go into making a space feel right and making sure that the functions of the kitchen, even in a smaller kitchen, still move smoothly. <laughs> Quick questions with an architect. Why do you love math? I loved math because I was able to uh, draw volume and understand how to do perspective drawings. Just really just geometry in general. Did you enjoy math when you were growing up? I really enjoyed math growing up when I was younger. I thought I was really good at it, but as I got older, it got harder and it was more of a challenge for me, but I kept working and, and you know, and it was, it was fine, but it definitely got harder. How do you use area and perimeter? Um, I always use area and perimeter when doing designing an addition or doing a custom home. It's always important to understand the size of the structure that you're that you're uh, building for cost reasons, but also just to, to know exactly how much space you have and how much you need. How important is it to be precise? Uh, it's very important that measurements are precise, especially when measuring an existing building. You have to know what what's there and what 
what can be added to that reasonably. When, as an architect, I get involved with the structure of a building, and so it's important for me to understand how large is a space, how large do beams and structural members need to be, because it changes the weight. Is it important to show your thinking? I show that even from day one. So when I'm meeting with a client and showing them the initial designs, which are just hand sketches, it's important for me to, to explain to them why I made the choices that I did with their project. Because oftentimes when you just look at a space, you're like, well, I think I wanna do this. Well, once you start to dive into the structure and where, where the load is coming down and how the space actually works now, it might change once I start to look at a project. And it's important to explain to my clients so that they understand exactly, exactly what, why I made the decisions that I did. And then from us, from contractors, uh, that is important because it's like, I, I'm taking all the data that I can find and I will insert that into an Excel sheet um, on my computer. And I tally up all the information that they're able to give me to make sure that I, I am accurate in what I'm ex um, expressing to my clients. What is your best piece of advice for math students? I would say you just have to do what you love. Um, do what you find something you're good at, but find something that you love to do that you can get paid to do and, and be happy doing it. And math just happens to be a huge part of, of what my career is, you know, and, and I found something that I love and I use math every day. I use art every day, physics, that kind of thing. So, All right. Now that we know how an architect uses area and perimeter measurements, let's see what dentists use. My name is Dr. Joel Richards, owner of Westville Pediatric Dental, meaning I'm a pediatric dentist which is a specialist in kids. So how does a dentist use math? Oh yeah, we use math every day, not just the dentist, but also my dental hygienist and my front desk and managers as well. Pretty much use it with every single patient. Oh, we love using fractions. Actually, every time I do a filling, I use a fraction. So say I'm doing a filling and I use a little bit of numbing sauce, right? The num-num sauce. So that num-num sauce, I'll know if I use one full carp, that's, you know, that's one of the numbing sauce. But I'll see, maybe use a little bit more. I'll put in there that I'm using one and a fourth or maybe, you know, one and a half. So we use that every time, and that lets me know the measurement, how safe Hi. we can be, how much we can give that child as well. You know, I look at a child and I, you know, generally know their age, or what, what we call is when you have a certain amount of teeth, it's called a dentition. So you have the baby teeth dentition, which is called primary teeth, and then the permanent teeth with the permanent dentition. And when you're in between there and you've lost a couple of baby teeth and now you have some permanent teeth coming in, it's called the transitionary dentition. So I can look at a child and know, you know, if they're younger than five or so, they're probably just gonna have 20 teeth, which is what we would expect. Or if we have about a, a year, a baby or an infant that's about a year old, you know, they might have anywhere from, you know, two to, to eight teeth on average. It's just kind of interesting because there's, you know, there's the clinical stuff where we're counting teeth. But I think a lot of people don't know, as a kid's dentist especially, we find missing teeth, extra teeth. And sometimes we call those extra teeth supernumerary tooth, or I like to call them like superpower tooth. And sometimes I can t I've been taking an x-ray, I can kind of estimate when those would come in. So it's kind of cool. So some people have extra teeth that they don't know, and it's very common that it runs in families. So I always ask questions about if it runs in families, you know, did they have superpower teeth too? So I think that's really fun. And sometimes teeth are fused together. So when I count, my number might be off because those fused teeth that are kind of grew together and they kind of are like cuddling a little bit closer, they, um, you know, now I know the number. So then I would take x-rays to verify those numbers. As time, um, I mean, the most obvious one is we try to schedule our you know, patients a certain allotted time. So some appointments may take 20 minutes, some kids might need 30 minutes. So we kind of know how to you know, properly schedule those patients. So throughout the day, you know, we start at 8.30. Our lunches is generally one to two. So then in between and all those times, you know, I'll have many patients, sometimes 10, sometimes 15. I generally know that my hygienist will have about 30 minutes at least to spend with their patients, so generally they will have 15, 15 patients during that day. We actually do do the metric system, so we generally measure things in millimeters. So, you know, that's really small, so one, one, one centimeter is 10 millimeters, 
we know that you know different averages of teeth though so that's a really really good question so when I know like that tooth cavity or sugar bug goes into it it might go in a millimeter or two sometimes it'll be a few more millimeters and that's how I can kind of guess or approximate how close we are to the nerve of that tooth because we want to keep that tooth safe and healthy. Quick questions with a dentist. What was your favorite part of math? My favorite thing about math um, definitely not the timed tables. Those were always kind of stressful and I just know some kids are really super fast at them, probably like all you guys, like super good at first. But, um, you know, maybe doing some word problems and throwing in some words in there. How do you know what supplies to buy? I mean, it depends on the month because sometimes we, you know, the growing, we get more patients that want to come see us and we want to see them. And then we kind of have averages. So we actually can set up those averages with our company. So our, our representatives, maybe from Oral-B or whoever's supplying our toothbrushes, they'll actually know, okay, you ordered this much this time, maybe we'll order more this time. Yeah, yeah, we have a spreadsheet on Excel, so by keeping track of all that, we can be, be very prepared because you don't want to over or under buy stuff because then you don't have it when you need it or you buy too much and then you, you don't have enough to, to have lunch that day. How important is it to be precise? Oh yeah, measurements to be precise is very critical, especially as a dentist, we're working with you know, a hard tooth, but we're also working with a live, live entity of that tooth, which is called the nerve and the blood vessels or the pulp. So when we want to be really precise with something, we need to know exactly how that looks like. So that's why we'll take x-rays. We have seen, you know, millions of these, so then we can kind of look at them and we can kind of see how close are we to that nerve if we're filling a cavity, which is really gentle and we kind of um, will know if we have the exact measurement, we know exactly the width of our burrs. So the burrs is that toothbrush piece that goes and cleats out the soft part of the sugar bug. And if it's getting closer and that tooth bug is kind of turned into a dinosaur egg, we might want to get a little, you know, get a little closer, might even put a special medicine. So we're gonna be very price, actually, precise. We're actually, believe it or not, in dentists, we can actually kind of measure, even kind of with our eyes a little bit, so the tenth of a millimeter sometimes. Wow. We practice that in dental school and we still practice that every day. Did you enjoy math growing up? Um, it wasn't my favorite, you know, doing math, but you know, I'm a science guy for sure. So I always love science and history. Um, reading but you know what now that I, I realize it does I use it every day like it's it's kind of phenomenal it's really really kind of cool how it helps me provide um, good care to my patients um, you know setting up appointments working with my whole team and staff to make the whole appointment safe and fun do you need to show your thinking dentists especially kids dentists you know I work with parents and the child so I think it's really, really important to be a good teacher. And to be a good teacher, we've got to kind of show things of what we do. So I'm really big on pictures. So I love, you know, when parents maybe have a tooth that got bumped, they can send pictures to me. Well, I also have little forms that I'll show them. And then I'll kind of review that. Same thing when I have x-rays. We don't just say there's cavities there. We want to show you. We want you to understand and see the cavity process. And sometimes they're little baby ones, little shadows. We can maybe monitor them and see what happens over six months and then take new x-rays or radiographs is what we call them. But it's really good to be able to, to look at those, look at those x-rays, teach and show and, and kind of explain the process. What is your best piece of advice for math students? I would say, I think repetition. Everything we do, I think in life, I always learn better by repetition. I think someone said that maybe you have to do something 12 times before it becomes a good or like a habit or something. But when I want to practice something or be really good, you know, it's repetition. It's doing perfect practice makes perfect. Challenge problem, dentist edition. Dr. Joel needs to schedule three patients. Each appointment takes a half hour. How much time will Dr. Joel need to see all of the patients? Remember, you can pause to take your time and solve. Three times one half. That's the same as one half plus one half plus one half, which equals three halves or yes. one and a half hours. Did you get it correct? Did you use a different strategy? Well, that was a lot of math. So what surprised you? What did you already know? Anything shock you? Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of How It's Math. Want more videos involving real life math and how-to videos for elementary math? 
Go ahead and like and subscribe. We post new videos every month. Bye! Find out more about the companies in this video here and also in the description below.